Hello and welcome to Innovation Celebration, the show where we celebrate recent advancements in science and technology, the people and ideas that make them possible, and the ways in which they enhance human flourishing. I'm Thomas Walker. And I'm Angelica Worth. And I want to start out today by talking about a solution to certain plant parasites um, that cause all kinds of uh, undesirable symptoms. And the reason we care about this, by the way, is that plant diseases and plant parasites often affect food crops. So obviously we're concerned about our food supply and we use plants for a number of other things too, for medicine, for fiber, for uh, beverages, and just for for decoration and enjoyment. So for example, yes, this one's fake, but uh, in this particular instance, the parasite we're talking about is called, uh, well, it's a group of bacteria called phytoplasmic bacteria. And these are obligate parasites, which means that they have to live in a living host. They can't survive for very long without a living host. They are, they are obligated uh, to have a host. Right. They're, well, they're obligated to be a parasite. <laughs> there are some parasites that can make do part of the time not being in a living host. These yeah. bacteria aren't one of them. Um, these bacteria are spread by insects. And, and when they're in the plant, they multiply in the phloem, which is the part of the plant's vasculature that moves the photosynthesis, photosynthase. So when the leaves photosynthesize, they make their sugars, moves throughout the plant in what's called the phloem. Right. And that's where these bacteria live. And it's sort of fitting, we're a little bit jumping the gun, I suppose, here on Halloween. This is a month in advance at a time of recording, but these are sort of Halloween-esque bacteria they cause witches broom and zombie plants <laughs> they affect somebody, pumpkins tell me turning up to do their trick or treat dressed as a bacterium <laughs> <laughs> great costume idea yeah um but what that actually means is witches broom in in trees and shrubs is when a bunch of branches grow really close together and so it looks like one of those old-fashioned straw brooms with the twigs sticking out everywhere um or if you think of harry potter but the Uh, the main reason we don't like that besides that it doesn't look very good is it increases the chances of other diseases and it also makes the branches less stable. So they're more likely to fall. And then we create a safety hazard. Uh, Zombie plants is a severe instance of these bacteria infesting where the plant doesn't grow, doesn't reproduce. It basically just exists so that the parasite can multiply. Obviously not desirable. And some other symptoms it can cause are yellowing leaves, rolled up leaves, um, and then the plant just kind of dying back in parts generally. So the people who have made a couple of breakthroughs on this recently and published in Cell Magazine is a group of researchers at the John Innes Center in the UK. This is a research center that's funded by a mixture of private and public sources. They kind of go for different grants. Some of them are government grants, some of them are are private grants and um, work with what they can get basically. Um, And the particular team that has published this is a team led by a Dr. Saskia Hogenhout. And so Dr. Hogenhout is very interested in the interactions between um, microorganisms like bacteria and plants. So you can see why she was interested in this particular uh, problem. And so what she and her team found is that um, it, well, the first breakthrough they had really is figuring out how the bacteria were causing the symptoms. So it had already been known that these bacteria existed, that these bacteria were causing the problems that I just described, the witch's broom and all of that, but they didn't know how. And so that's what Dr. Hogan Hout and her team first figured out. And they figured out that the bacteria were making a manipulator molecule, a protein that they've named SAP05. And SAP- um, SAP05? Yeah, SAP05, basically. <laughs> and, and what this protein does is it causes the it is causes key growth regulators in the plant to break down. So what do I mean by growth regulators? Uh, plants have hormones just like people do. And just like in people, the hormones regulate important physiological functions. And I remember when I was taking horticulture classes, we um, would manipulate some of these by adding extra hormones or blocking certain hormones. So a really memorable example was we put, we sprayed some plants with hormones to keep them shorter and some plants we did not And the control group in a couple of weeks, it was like two or three weeks, you could see the difference that some of the plants were way taller than the other plants, the, the ones that we had treated. Yeah. So that's the type of, of control that these growth regulators have and why they're important to the plant. They tell the plant, you know, which way to grow, when to flower, when to fruit, all of those sorts of things. And so this 
SAPO5 uh, protein gets rid of those um, growth regulators by hijacking what's called the proteasome. So the proteasome is something that basically all multicellular organisms have. We have them, plants have them, insects have them. Um, and their normal job is to get rid of excess proteins. So we talked about last week how, or I think it was last week, maybe the week before, about how your body has a normal way of getting rid of messed up proteins. Similarly, it has a normal way of getting rid of extra proteins. And that way it's called the proteasome. But what SAPO5 does is it takes over the proteasome. And rather than getting rid of excess proteins, it gets rid of these growth regulators that the plant actually needs. So Dr. Hogan and her team, after figuring all of that out, also figured out which two amino acids specifically the uh, protein was interacting with to make that happen. So then they wondered, I don't know if you remember, I said that the bacteria is spread by insects. So we're wondering if it affects the insects. And it turns out that the insect's proteasome is different enough that it doesn't affect the insects. Um, and specifically, those two amino acids are different in insects. So they tested a solution. And the solution was using some of the gene editing techniques we've talked about on the show before. They took the, two, the, the genetic material that codes for those two amino acids from the insects and inserted them into the plants. And then the plants were no longer affected by the bacteria. So they, they created a terrifying insect plant hybrid. <laughs> no. <laughs> they used a very precise method to solve a very specific problem. Um, and it, because they just transferred the genetic material that they needed. And that's, again, the benefit of the really precise gene editing tools that we have available today, like CRISPR. Um, and so just to drive home the, the benefits of this solution, it makes our food supply safer, uh, as well as our supply of all those other plants for all the other functions I mentioned for medicine, for fiber, for beverages, for decoration. Um, and... An additional advantage to this is, you know, of course we can spray for bugs, we can spray for, for different plant parasites and pathogens, but the insects and the pathogens tend to become resistant to the pesticides, besides the fact that if you use too many or if they, there's um, drift of the pesticide, then it can cause other secondary problems. So when we can uh, fix a problem without using those pesticides, it's usually better. Yeah, or you can end up killing the things that are helping you, like your, your own crops yeah. or insects that are helping pollinate things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can do that too. Yeah. Yeah. So non-pesticide solu pesticide solutions to plant disease problems have clear benefits for, for people. So shout out to Dr. Hogan Hot and her team for, for figuring that out. Awesome. Um, so for my main feature today, um, I'm going to cover an area that I've covered a bit before, but in a different sense. So I'm sort of back on the private space flight thing, but this time I want to talk about a new process that should speed up the manufacture of rocket engines that's come about because of the you know, involvement of private sector and space flight recently. And um, so to give some background here, um, developing a rocket engine or a, a new type of spacecraft, which usually means having a new engine in it, is, is a very, very long, laborious and expensive process. So um, when um, NASA was developing the space shuttle back in the 1970s, it took them from about 73 to 81 to get from drawing board to first flight. It's you know, sort of almost decade long process of designing and building the thing. And um, it ran four years late. It was you know, billions over budget. Uh, and part of the reason for that is, you know, you've got to design and manufacture the engines that go into these vehicles. And then when you test them and you, they do what's called a static firing, the, you know, the, the rocket engine is on the ground facing sideways, bolted down, and they just test fire it. And, um, and you know, if something goes wrong and the thing blows up, you've got to build it again from scratch. You know, and this happens the, so much, they've, they have a name for it, don't they? Oh, well, yeah, there's a, there's a term used in the space flight industry, which is rapid unscheduled disassembly or RUD. Um, which is a wonderful euphemism for blowing up, um, which is, is, is used you know, during launches quite a lot. You'll hear, um, you know, they say you know, the vehicle underwent a rapid unscheduled disassembly during launch, which means it exploded. And, um, but yes, yeah, so that happens a lot during the testing phase as well. And, um, and so, you know, you, you have to, when, when that happens, you have to redesign the thing and then rebuild it. And this is incredibly complicated piece of machinery that has thousands of parts in it and you know it's built to withstand these in huge pressures you know there's uh, it, it, you know thousands of tons worth of tnt explosion equivalent going on through this engine all the time 
and um, and so you know it's, it's very very expensive to build and to build new ones every time one you know destroys itself is incredibly expensive um you know the public sector was struggling with that you know the, the as i said the space shuttle development program was under enormous cost constraints and that unfortunately had fatal consequences ultimately the sort of corner cutting that went on to stay within or you know close to budget during that and, uh, and the same thing's happening now with project constellation that's you know decades behind schedule um, the private sector can't afford to do that uh, you know the private sector has investors to answer to and you know if, if they don't deliver results and they don't deliver you know some money from your know, people flying on the rocket then, you know, then their investors are going to come asking you know, what are we paying for uh, SpaceX knows this all too well you know the, the Falcon 1 the original rocket they built went through three unsuccessful test flights before it eventually flew successfully um, to, to space the Merlin engine for it went through that same development process the Starship that they're developing now you know has gone through several fiery accidents before getting to a point where it's you know safe to operate and um, and say so, you know the, the, the cost sink of building these things over and over again is is not really sustainable for a private company enter the solution um, which is a form of 3d printing known as selective laser sintering and um, and this is a really not actually you know we think of 3d printing as something that's come along in the last decade or two this is actually a technology invented in the 1980s uh, and it was developed by Dr. Carl Deckard and his academic advisor, Dr. Joe Beeman. And they were working at the University of Texas at, at Austin uh, under the sponsorship of DARPA, the sort of procurement wing of the US military in the 1980s. So, you know, they were looking at this as a, as a technology for military manufacturing. But after they developed it, they actually formed a company called DTM to apply it commercially. Uh, well, that was later bought by 3D Systems, which is a 3D printing company. Uh, and um, and this is a so you know three D printing often involves you know that sort of crystal layer of plastic structure that you just sort of yeah I have a little layer. a little trinket made that way where you can literally see the layers of plastic yeah. it's like a sedimentary rock but yeah plastic um, so this is very different to that this is using a metal powder and high powered lasers because lasers are cool. Uh, well, powered. they solve everything, apparently. <laughs> yeah. We've already covered <laughs> lasers that help uh, make nuclear fusion possible. I'm going to talk more about lasers later today. Yeah. Uh, these high-powered lasers fuse these metal, this metal powder into, into shapes. So, um, you know, selectively applying and not applying the laser creates areas of gap and areas of solid metal uh, around them. Uh, and so you're able to machine a metallic component using this um, 3D printer. And, um, and a company called SLM Solutions um, came up with the idea of applying this technology to rocket engines. And they redesigned the F1 engine, which is the engine that sits inside the Saturn V rocket that launched the Apollo astronauts to the moon. So it's basically one of the largest rockets ever built in human history, enormously complicated engine. Uh, uh, an engine that has 5,600 components in it. And using this printing process, they were able to reduce that to 40 components. Wow. So, um, you know, this, the, Advantages are, are, are multiple. Like, f firstly, manufacturing processes are a lot quicker uh, and cheaper. If you can just print the thing instead of having to build all these components individually, then bolt or weld them together. And um, and so, you know, you're, when you need to make a redesign because something goes wrong in a test, you can do that in a computer system and then just print the result. You know, you don't have to go out, you know, suppliers, please you know, build this one, this shape instead kind of thing. You know, and, re-engineer the whole thing from the ground up. Uh, also, having so many fewer components means you actually reduce the weight because you've not got all those joins and, and you know, attachments and things that you need to have in there as well. When you're dealing with rocketry, weight is really important. You know, every ounce of weight is more fuel that's needed. It's less payload you can carry. So um, you know, that's a big advantage as well. And, um, and their actual sort of end goal is to try and get to a situation where the entire engine could be printed in one go. But um, that's not really feasible just because of the complexity of it, at least at this stage. But, you know, the reduction in complexity they've already achieved is incredibly impressive. Um, you know, the benefits of this are sort of, you know, again, very, you know, many. There's, um, you know, just for one thing, private space flight re you know, reduces the cost of entry to space so much, not just for people to go and travel, which would be a really good thing when it happens, but at the moment more for cargo. It's you know, enabling companies to get satellites into orbit that can provide better connectivity, better weather monitoring and environmental monitoring and all that kind of stuff. Science in orbit 
you know, it's, it enables universities and research institutions to get experiments into orbit more cheaply, things like that. So, you know, uh, as well as the military aspect of it. So, um, you know, there's the, the advantages of, of enabling private space, like commercially and for the human race more broadly are certainly great. Uh, and if you can speed up the development of these new rockets and develop that technology faster, that's a wonderful thing. This could also apply to other industries. The only caveat there is the high powered lasers are expensive. So in the situation of rocketry, where the alternative is blowing up and rebuilding your complicated piece of technology every time, it represents a cost saving. But you know, in another industry, it probably wouldn't at this stage. But it's you know an encouraging step towards uh, a process that you know there's now an incentive to cheapen that process as well. So, well, isn't there a safety aspect of it too? If you're making it easier to test the engine more frequently, then you're yeah. uh, discouraging those cost cutting. Yeah, uh, it creates the opportunity to test more failure scenarios. And, right. and you know, do more live testing than you can, let's say, building and rebuilding it every time. And, and you know, rockets, you know, astronauts will joke that they're stepping on top of a giant firecracker. You know, it is a risky venture. It's you know, this you know, enormously explosive object. So you know, if you can make that safer by you know, running through some more of those potential scenarios where something might go wrong, you know, areas of different pressure and things like that that you experience during a launch situation then yeah, you, you can hopefully produce a safer product as well as a cheaper product at the end of the day. And, you know, and, and that brings me back to how having the private sector involved in space flight is not just reducing costs, although that's an incredibly good benefit, but you know, I think it has the potential to just propel the technology forward decades beyond what the public sector was doing and, um, and improve safety and just you know, make it a really viable commercial proposition as opposed to just the sort of realm of you know, a couple times a year, NASA missions that, you know, are fun to follow, but don't really advance things all that much for the human race. Right. Cool. Well, I think we're good to move on to our honorable mentions then. Um, and so I, the first one that I wanted to give a shout out to is a project that has successfully beamed the internet across the Congo River. The entire Using inter- lasers, like I promised. <laughs> and so the people doing this, it's a company called X, that's it, that's its name is X. Um, it's owned by Alphabet, which is the same parent company that owns Google. So it will and... be called Google Internet in no time at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the specific project name is called Project Tara and it's led by a person named Barris Erkman. And so what they've actually accomplished is they've successfully beamed a uh, very high speed internet, uh, 20 gigabytes per second, across the Congo River. And so to, for comparison, the average internet speed in the United States is just under hundred megabytes per second. So that's 0. 0.01 gigabytes per second. Mm. Um, and so this is connecting in this case, uh, the two, if, if you weren't aware, there are two Congo countries, the uh, Republic of the Congo and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, it not is. very aptly named, but- Yeah, but like never trust a country that has Democratic Republic in its name. <laughs> right. But, <laughs> but those are the names and it does connect those two countries. It actually, in this case, connects the, um, the, the capital cities, but it's a Kin- proof of concept. Um, Brazzaville and Kinshasa. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Those are the ones. And so it's worth noting that Project Tara uses technology from an earlier project called Project Loon. Uh, and the basic idea of, of both of these projects is to have a source for the internet that beams a laser to the receiving end which receives the laser. An important point of this is you have to keep the lasers in contact during this time. Direct line of sight. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so Project Loon was trying to do this using a hot air balloon um, as the source and beaming it to the ground. This created many challenges for keeping the lasers in contact, <laughs> not least of which is that hot air balloon moves. Um, and, and But they got really good at it. They got really good at making the adjustments that they needed to with mirrors and everything to constantly keep the lasers in contact. The drawback was it was very expensive. Um, and so Project Loon was eventually shut down, but Project Tara, Tara uses their advancements in keeping the, la- in the adjusting the mirrors to keep the lasers in contact. But rather than using hot air balloons, they're just using two land-based towers. Um, so as I said, they, they tested it by setting it up across the Congo River. And the Congo River, again, in case you weren't aware, isn't a tiny little stream. It's a giant river. And the distance between the two towers was 4.8 kilometers. Um, and so to connect the two sites because of that giant river in between them, using traditional means would have meant like 400 kilometers worth of cables. So this is 
significantly better. Um, and the test that they ran was in over the course of 20 days, they beamed 700 tetrabytes of data across the river. And to put that in perspective for Americans, that's about the amount of data that 100,000 Americans use in a month. And it's, it's, it's worth noting you're saying about the, you know, the difference in speed between you know, your typical American connection and, and this, but this is a, a trunk line that's going to carry probably thousands of more people's work. Yeah, this is going to serve th thousands of individuals. This isn't for one person. Yeah. It's not like everybody gets a 20 gig connection. No. no yeah. <laughs> no. Um, but this, this test run of beaming that much data had a 99.9% .9 reliability rate. So this is pretty good. Um, there's, so as I said, though, this is a proof of concept. Although the Congo countries are relatively remote, the capital cities are you know, understandably kind of the best off of them. Um, but it's more just a proof of concept to, you know, can we bring internet this way to these remote locations? And the answer is a resounding yes. Um, in some places, the challenge of this particular method is, like I said, the lasers have to stay in contact. So when you've got a lot of fog, for example, that creates a problem. So in the Congo, you don't have a lot of fog. So it's a really good location for it. Um, but other locations might not be so favorable. Yeah, I can see sort of rainy, foggy England on a January morning, probably not being a great place to set this kind of thing up. No, probably not. <laughs> um, but yeah, but still, it's a really exciting proof of concept of how we can bring internet to impoverished areas, to remote areas, and uh, which has all kinds of benefits for the people living there and, and the people doing the connecting because they yeah. can, you know, do business online, they can uh, be consumers online as well as... Um, education yeah. and, and just talking to people in other parts of the world. So and tons of advantages to getting more people connected that way. Connecting Africa to, to the internet um, and, and, you know, Africa is a region that's never had good infrastructure of any kind, even traditional infrastructure. And, um, you know, connecting it to that network is, is a benefit for everybody because, you know, that enables that trade to happen between the rest of the world's economy, which is really one giant economy at this point, which is Africa is still somewhat cut off from. Uh, right. That's what I'm saying is, you know, when, they, when they're able to get online, are, they're able to, to consume content and also, you know, to educate themselves, but also to start their own businesses, to take jobs yeah. online. Um, and so that's a benefit for everyone involved. That's how trade works. Yeah. It's an exciting new market for businesses all over the world as well. Yeah, Absolutely. A, yeah. A, a billion and a half people waiting to trade with you. It's Which is, I imagine, why Alphabet is taking that on. As, you know, yeah. bringing internet to these areas means expanding their customer or potential customer base. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, it's really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so I want to talk about some headphones now, um, which you know is is not as as dull as it may sound. Um, these are headphones that translate American Sign Language in real time, and, uh, and this is being developed by sorry, it's, uh, the technology is called Sonic ASL, and it's being developed by Zhang Peng Jin, uh, who's associate professor at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Buffalo. Uh, it was University of New York at Buffalo, I should say. And, uh, and his PhD student under him, Yin Cheng Jin, you know, they both end in Jin, they're not related. These are Asian names, so it's the other way around. That's really their first name. Um, so, you know, the articles I've read about this were keen to stress that, you know, they're just colleagues, they're not related. Uh, but he's a PhD student under um, Zhang Peng Jin. And, um, and this is, you know, the, 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 there are currently systems like this that allow, um, you know, a, a hearing person to interpret sign language being used by a deaf person, but most of them rely on video technology. So mm -hmm. you're kind of filming the other person, which presents all sorts of privacy issues. If you're just, you know, filming somebody in their, you know, daily life. So they've been trying to find solutions that get around this. And just as a side note, by the way, obviously some deaf people do learn to speak, but that's extremely difficult, particularly if you're born deaf and you have no reference for what sound sounds like. So, um, you know, if you can find a solution that you know, avoids people having to you know, learn to communicate in a medium that they can't actually sense themselves, then you know, that's, that's a much better option. Um, so the solution they came up with here is a really interesting one because uh, it uses the Doppler effect. And, um, and people with an astronomy bent like me are familiar with the Doppler effect because it's how we measure the movement of objects that are far away with light. But most people will probably experience it with sound more. And an example of this is when a vehicle drives past you like a car and you know, you, it has a higher pitch sound as it's coming towards you and a lower pitch sound as it's coming, as it's going away, you get that, ah. and that's because as it's coming towards you, the sound waves are going out at a consistent pitch, assuming you know, the engine's running at the same speed. 
But as it's coming towards you, because the car's moving, the sound waves are compressed together. So you get a higher pitch sound. And then as it's going away from you, the sound waves are pulled apart by that relative motion. So you get a lower pitch sound. So, um, so that's why something moving towards you has a higher pitch and moving away has a lower pitch. Same reason that in astronomy, objects that are moving away have a redder light than that are coming towards us have a lower light. It gets, compresses the wavelength. And, um, and when you move your hands doing something like sign language, you create all these little waves in the air when you do it. And this device detects those uh, and using the Doppler. So effect, it must be incredibly sensitive. Yeah, um, it's detecting what movements a hand is doing based on the you know, direction it's sending the air in. And, um, and it sounds like that would be incredibly you know, difficult to make work, but um, it's achieved a 93.8% accuracy in its initial testing. In its initial testing, they taught it a, a, a dictionary, if you want to say, a vocabulary is the word I'm looking for of 42 words so you know it has so the person is signing within this sort of 42 word vocabulary and it's learning to differentiate those they're constantly trying to increase that and um and you know the next stage really is is to teach it a larger vocabulary um as say sam Jing says um it's an exciting proof of concept uh, that could eventually greatly help improve communication between deaf and hearing populations so you know, it very much is you know just showing that this way of doing it is possible, and then developing it into a commercial product is a much longer process. Um, another barrier, as well as that larger vocabulary, there's two other barriers really. One is that um, in ASL specifically in American Sign Language, um, facial expressions are a really big part of the communication. Uh, that is true in other sign languages as well, but um, I think it varies between them the sort of the extent of the role, but um, it's certainly very significant in some. So they don't currently have a solution for how that part of the meaning is going to get picked up without using cameras. So that's a sort of next stage project for them. And then and the other issue is that every country has a different sign language. Like it's actually almost worse than spoken languages. Like British sign language and American sign language are completely different languages. And, um, and that's true pretty much with every country around the world. So, um, you know, they, they say, you know, there's no reason why it can't be taught other languages, but you know, that, that is a, a longer process as well. So it is an exciting proof of concept. It's a really interesting piece of just how you can use funky science to achieve the seemingly impossible. And then, you know, it just gives you a sense of, you know, just what's achieved. But like I was talking about last week, you know, with um, how audio speakers work and things, you know, just these basic physical principles have so much more applicability than you might realize when you, you know, develop the technology. and. Uh, so that's quite exciting to my mind. But uh, the other thing is just that any technology that helps people with disabilities you know, recover some normality in how they live their lives, I think is a wonderful thing. And that's one of the greatest examples of how good a thing technology is for human life. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, expanding communication and helping, helping people participate more fully in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Very useful. So the next... Um, Breakthrough I want to give a shout out to, well, the last one for me today is a treatment for ulcerative colitis. And so ulcerative colitis is an inflammatory bowel condition. It's not usually fatal, but it is very uncomfortable. Um, essentially, it causes sores in your digestive tract, which creates symptoms as awful as you can imagine. Um, and in the worst case scenario, patients have to have part of their uh, digestive tract actually removed. Um, and just for an idea of its scope, it currently affects about a million people in the United States alone. Uh, yeah. And so this study was conducted at Stanford, a private university, obviously top tier private university in the U.S., under the direction of uh, Dr. Pervesh Khatri. And so he explained that, quote, about 30 percent of ulcerative colitis patients eventually have to undergo a colectomy as a last resort. As a drastic measure, you're removing part of your body. So obviously we, we don't want to do that if we can avoid it. But there's no effective treatment for it in the US, the only thing doctors can do really is prescribe anti-inflammatories to try to reduce the sores, but that doesn't always work. So these people are mostly just suffering through it. But what Katri and his team have found is that uh, atorvastatin, which is a cholesterol lowering drug that's often sold under the brand name Lipitor, uh, tends to decrease the symptoms to decrease the need for, for medication and hospitalization and eventually surgery. Um, but what's interesting about this advancement, besides the fact that it could help people, you know, relieve their suffering is the way in which they went about finding it. So what Katri and his team did is they, first of all, compared uh, genomic data. So the information about the genetic material of a bunch of anonymized patients to, you know, 
remove safety con uh, privacy concerns, sorry. Um, and they, by doing that, they were able to find ulcerative colitis genetic signature. So the group of genes that pretty much all ulcerative colitis patients have and very few non-ulcerative colitis, colitis patients don't have. Um, did I mix that up? Most patients with it have this. Yeah, 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 Most right. people who don't have it don't. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so they found its genetic signature. And then they looked at what are some FDA approved drugs that cancel out the effects of those particular genes. So again, this is building on some of the genomic work we've mentioned on the show before, you know, the Human Genome Project being the big one. Um, but of those FDA approved drugs, they found three um, and two of them are chemotherapy drugs. So those are the drugs typically used to treat cancer. Um, and so obviously they have major side effects. Um, but there was one type of drug that doesn't. And that is a group of drugs called statins, which are super safe uh, to the point that some doctors have joked we should put them in the water supply. Nobody's actually doing that, <laughs> that I'm aware of. <laughs> but, but the point is they have basically no side effects, but all kinds of benefits. Um, like I said, cholesterol lowering is the one that they're, they're typically prescribed for. But, uh, but just to confirm that this uh, group of drugs, these statins would work, they also looked at anonymized data, Katrina's team looked at anonymized data on patients with ulcerative colitis symptoms who also happened to be taking those drugs. And they found that in most cases, it decreased the symptoms the patients were reporting, it decreased their need for anti-inflammatories, decreased the surgeries and hospitalizations required. This does not unfortunately mean um, that doctors can start prescribing a torvostatin for patients with ulcerative colitis. It's not FDA approved for that yet. Um, it has to go through clinical testing before it is. But the benefit of this approach is that it's a model that could be repeated by you know, using a data we already have to figure out what drugs might potentially work that we already have um, that could work for other conditions. And this is something they've done in treating uh, COVID-19, um, but this is a way of expanding what we already have to help more people um, using data we already have. So very exciting um, innovation in the way that they went about finding this treatment without just using people as guinea pigs. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so sort of our last three have all been about helping people with conditions, I think, because I'm going to talk about another piece of technology that helps a different kind of disabled people. Um, so this is a device invented by a company called Evolution Devices. Uh, they're a health company focused on what they call digital physical therapy. So it's the intersection of physical therapy, you know, for you know joint and muscle issues and things like that with uh, computer digital technology. Um, so a nice piece of inter interdisciplinary research. And Evo, EvoWalk is a device that um, patients who have, or people who have uh, walking impairments uh, wear below their knee. And, it's a relatively uh, small device, isn't it? Yeah, it's just like a black box on a strap. Um, mm -hmm. But what it does is basically you set up um, as a set of cameras so that you know when you're exercising or something at home you know trying to walk around uh, the cameras can monitor how you walk and move and then the device is using machine learning to learn from your movements extrapolate what your problems are and then when you're wearing it and walking it walking with walking whilst wearing it um, it uses electroshock therapy to stimulate your nerves um, and electroshock therapy by the way i think some people have this image in their heads of you know what used to be used in old-timey asylums on like mental patients that's not what it is today <laughs> yeah no, um, this it, is a, there's no like white flashes coming out no <laughs> no i've had it i've had it done for some back problems i've had and it's uh they just put electrodes on your skin really small ones and they use the electricity to help um I don't, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but it's not at all painful. It's yeah. a little bit of a strange ses sensation in during, like while it's happening, but then afterwards it actually feels really nice. So it yeah. helps with a number of muscle conditions. Yeah. And, and what it's doing here is, is that in their words, they're calling it an artificial nerve. So it, it's stimulating nerves that, you know, aren't, aren't being stimulated like they should be um, to control nerves in the toes and the feet. So, um, you know, it encourages the, the proper movement of the, of the leg that's not happening naturally. And, um, and they tried it on this guy who had survived a, a what's called a hemiplegic stroke, 
So that's the stroke that leaves half of your body, you know, hemi from the Greek meaning half, and then plegic as in paraplegic. So it leaves half of your body unable to move. Uh, his mm -hmm. entire left side was, was paralyzed. And um, using the device, he set out to walk a five kilometer race. Um, intended to do it in an hour and a half. He actually managed to do it in an hour and 23. So, you, you and I, I saw the video um, of it, which I can put in the links actually, um, where his, um, you know, he's, he's still got clearly a sort of wonky walk, but it's making it much better than, you know, he's not able to walk properly at all without it. So, um, you know, it, he, he's clearly just overjoyed in that video, of his, you know, his ability to actually get out and, and walk around the world again. So, um, as I say, um, you know, the benefit is, is the same as I was describing earlier. It's the ability of people to live their lives fully again. Um, just one little note, which is that the CEO, um, Pierre Luigi Mantuvani, um, was inspired to start the company and spent several years developing this because his father had multiple sclerosis. So um, it's an interesting example of a person, a, a person's kind of you know, own life experience inspiring them to create a wonderful thing. So kudos to him and to the company. And I hope people get to benefit from this before too long. More people do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that was our, our roundup of life enhancing uh, achievements for the week. So I started out by talking about a solution for phytoplasmic bacteria, a pathogen that causes all kinds of problems in plants. And then you continued by talking about a method for 3D printing rocket parts that makes it cheaper and faster to build and test uh, rocket engines. Uh, indeed, and then you talked about using lasers to beam internet around Africa. Uh, I talked about headphones that can translate sign language using the Doppler effect. Uh, you talked about treatments for ulcerative colitis. Am I saying that right? I always- I think so, that. yeah. And, um, and then I talked about the uh, EvoWalk device for helping people regain the use of their legs. So- Fantastic. Uh, Thank you very much for joining us and uh, we'll be back. We have some interesting episodes coming up, hopefully in the next few months, some slight departures. A couple guests for you guys, probably. Yeah, all, all being well, um, as well as more of the same. So we look forward to seeing you soon.